Natasha Gregson Wagner is bringing the story of her mother, Natalie Wood, to HBO. The film, Natalie Wood, What Remains Behind, is uh, premiering on HBO on May 5th. I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby, joined by Natasha and the film's director, Laurent Bouzereau. And, and Natasha, so I guess I just want to start with, um, you know, doing a personal story for a documentary has to be a, a, a daunting thing. So, so what was it that made you decide to take this very personal aspect of your life and, and bring it into documentary form? Well, one of the big reasons for me was in 2012, I had my daughter Clover and, um, you know, she is my, my mom's only grandchild. And, and so I, I started to think more about my mom's legacy through her eyes. And I started to feel a real responsibility to make sure that legacy is, is that, that it's focused on the right elements and that a lot of the misinformation that's out there, I wanted to clarify. So this is not something that she has to deal with when she grows up. And then when I met Laurent and we, we talked about our vision, we both were so much on the same page. I felt just very trusting of him and trusting of the story that we wanted to tell. So in, in those ways, I, I feel like I sort of turned myself over a little bit to Laurent and turned my family over to him. Well, and then Laurent, that has to be kind of like a, a, a really specific responsibility. Um, so were you at, in any way kind of uh, apprehensive about that responsibility that you were taking on with this particular uh, story? Uh, yeah, because, um, y you know, each time I, I start a new project, it's always like, why now? What, what is that subject matter relevant to today? So I asked myself those questions and as I got to know Natasha and her family, um, and they shared memories of, of Natalie Wood, I, I just realized that there was so much about her that is still relevant to new generations today. And even for the very young who may not know who she is, I think they will want to watch this film because it really is a story of a family. And there's a lot of, of, of things in it that you can relate to. So that was, th that felt, uh, um, that was something that I was asking myself, can I, can I make a film about a Hollywood star that would feel right for today's audiences? And the answer was definitely yes. And, and the other thing that I wanted to make sure, and Natasha and everyone involved was very supportive, I wanted to have a voice as a filmmaker. I didn't want to feel like I was doing a celebration, you know, it was something controlled by the family because it needed to have the honesty and the integrity of, um, of a film done by someone outside the circle and uh when I, I and yet i needed to gain their trust uh so once that happened then i really felt very much empowered to tell the story and took it extremely seriously because um, I really fell in love with this family, really, and, and we've become friends in the process of making this. Uh, I think Natasha and I have experienced uh, a, a journey that was uh, fraught with uh, challenges, including uh, you losing your dad, and as early as, as, as recently as a few weeks ago, you lost your best friend in Mark Crowley, who was your mom's best friend. So, um, and, and, you even lost your, your doggy when we were on our way to interview Mia Farrow. So it was full of emotional, you know, challenges and, and I, I really channeled those emotions on a very deep level. In fact, there's not one interview that I did um, where I didn't break down and, and cried and same thing with the crew that was with me because, you know, when you at some point we were going to talk about the triumph and and the beauty of this family and life. And at one point, we're going to talk about loss and ultimately triumph over loss. But, um, you know, it was really, really tough. And I think those emotions, uh, each time I did a new interview, like kind of confirmed that if I could 
pouring to the film the emotion that I was I was feeling as I was filming that this would be a really a really important film for people to watch. And that actually kind of segues perfectly because both of you coming at this from kind of different points of view, Natasha, you as a daughter and Laurent, you as a filmmaker and somebody who's been, you know, kind of entrenched in Hollywood and a lot of your projects. Um, so I'm going to ask you both the same question. Is there something about um, Natalie that you really had no idea or there was there a revelation about the woman that maybe you guys didn't know before? And I don't care who answers first. <laughs> Uh, Laurent, you answer first, and then. Well, I mean, I mean, I think uh, uh, if you wanted to 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 jump in, you want me to go first. Let me you to go, go first. first. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, I mean, for me, you know, I only knew Natalie Wood through her movies, right? And and um, I discovered that she had a choice um, at one point in her career to to decide what movies uh, she was going to make, and therefore, what emerged for me was an autobiographical actor, someone who actually chose movies very carefully because they spoke to her. Either they stood for something she had experienced herself, or they stood for values that she believed in. So that was a big revelation to me. And, and, and then through the home movies that uh, we, we found and the personal photos that, that you know, Natasha and the family shared with me, I, I really got to see a real person. You know, it's, it's very hard to imagine actors of her generation being normal or relatable. It just feels like they, they lived in another world on another planet and and uh, never went to the supermarkets or anything like this. And with Natalie Wood, I just I just went like I know this woman. She's just like my mom, you know? And 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 that was a big revelation that she was not this unattainable, unreachable, you know, movie star. And, and for me, I guess I would say that um, I didn't so much have revelations about her because I think I knew so, m a lot about her, so much about her. But really, what I had was just um, corroboration or reverberation of what I knew about my coming back to me. And so, for me, as her daughter, you know, sitting in the room and to Laurent conduct. A lot of these interviews and listening to the stories or when I was reading um, the public person private property um, you know I, I felt that I I knew her but of course we just wanted to do her justice to do her legacy justice and to really share with the world you know what a courageous triumphant joyful warm human being she was and and how modern she is today you know i mean everything that she was that she believed in and that she was you know supported and kind of fought for in the 60s and the 70s are all so relevant now yeah it, it, one of the things that kind of comes through the film is that she was so contemporary in a way that kind of defies uh, a timeline. Um, and one of the most kind of affecting things that I think is towards the end of the documentary, when I think the question is asked, you know, what would she be doing? Had What kind of roles would she be pursuing? And, and for either one of you, I mean, in this era of, you know, media changing and streaming and things like that, where there are so many different opportunities, what kind of opportunities do you think she would be drawn towards? Laurent answers this very well, and I think you should do that. <laughs> and I can, I can chime in. You give me way too much credit. Well, you know, it's fascinating watching her movies again in preparation for this film. You sort of get the whole history of Hollywood um, just watching just her movies. 
and it starts with the really heavy controlling studio system and it ends with a movie like Brainstorm that is breaking all conventions and, and new visual effects and everything in between where Natalie Wood would make movies like Love with a Proper Stranger, you know, which is right behind you, Natasha, and yeah. and, <laughs> and, and, and it's new Hollywood or, or film with Sidney Pollack or Paul Mazursky who are just starting their careers and she's not afraid of experimenting with new directors. In fact, that's very empowering to her. And, and again, it's a very much unlike a lot of actors of her generation. Uh, um, uh, you know, pretty much when the studio system died, a lot of those actors had very, very tough time graduating to other roles. And, and to work with other filmmakers. Um, and the other thing she was doing that was amazing was she was doing television events, uh, um, you know, like so-called movies of the week. And, and that was not necessarily popular with, uh, uh, if you were an actor from the screen, to do a television film was saying, oh, I'm no longer doing cinema, I'm doing TV. Well, today that line is completely no longer there, thank God. But back then she was taking a risk, but she was taking a risk because she was, she believed in The Cracker Factory, which is a, a book she had optioned and, and wanted to make as a TV movie because she and felt- also I, I think, Laurent, just to, to just chime in for a second, she was very intrigued by directors. I mean, that was always, especially, new directors, up and coming directors. So I think, you know, she would have wanted to work with Tarantino. She would have wanted to work with Paul Thomas Anderson. She would have wanted to work with, you know, all these, these guys that are doing so many things so, so interesting. And I think she would have directed, produced. Um, she was going to star in a play for the first time, Anastasia at the Amundsen in, in 1982. She probably would have written a book. I mean, I, I think the sky would have been the limit for her, as Mia Farrow says in the documentary. She'd be doing so much, and I think her acting would have deepened. You know, I, I, I mean, it is her loss is so great for so many reasons, but certainly the the work. You know, she would have continued to do more really interesting work. I believe. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I have to ask, of course, because you know, one of the kind of the emotional high points of the film is the series of interviews with Robert Wagner. In the light of all of, you know, a lot of the I will use air quotes on the word information um, yeah. that that goes around. Um, was that a tricky decision to make to say because you could have easily done this and not gone there. Uh, why did you decide to go there and how tricky was it to navigate that? Well, Laurent and I from the beginning, I think from one of our first meetings, we said we want to talk to my stepdad and we want to give him a chance and a platform to speak his truth in an environment where he feels safe. Right, Laurent? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that was that was actually you know, gonna make or break the documentary because we felt it was, you know, just so polarizing and such an important thing to do. Um, so, so we did, you know, but it was, it was really um, courageous on both the part of Natasha and, and Robert Wagner to, to, to go there, you know, and it was very intense two days that that was the first thing we filmed. And, um, you know, there was a, you could have heard a pin drop, you know, really, it was so, so incredibly, uh, you know, intense. So in, in that vein, Natasha, um, has Robert Wagner seen it and, and how does he feel about it? So when we, when we were shooting, the, he stayed with me at my house, um, for I think three or four nights. And afterwards it felt so good, you know? So it, it isn't that he hasn't wanted to talk about that night. It's that he's wanted to do it on his own terms and with someone he felt safe with. And so it just worked out so well, you know, that this opportunity, we brought this opportunity to him um, and then 
he saw he saw a cut of it on the computer and then Laurent held a screening for him a small screening in Los when was it before Sundance yeah it was right before Sundance I think yeah so in early January and um he's he's so happy with the film he's so happy with the film he he tells me every day and he'll, he'll call Laurent every day if Laurent lets him and he'll <laughs> say how much he loves the movie right yeah he is so so funny you know like he'll call and say I don't tell you how much I love the movie this is extraordinary da 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 <laughs> and it's so great uh, and and um I I just think it's um there's so many you know um putting aside the tragedy there's so many beautiful things in it and um you know it's it must be really wonderful to be able to to see some of those images again and to refocus the discussion of Nafi Wood on 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 exactly that what remains behind as opposed to that that horrible night and and one of the things that we're in this kind of time period where, um, you know, social media and, you know, the media in general is kind of so kind of entrenched in the lives of celebrities and actors and movie stars. Um, and so when you were looking at back at the history of Natalie Wood, uh, did you see kind of like, is there somebody today who has kind of that? same energy but also it's kind of that same willingness to go outside of what may be expected of her wow uh you know somebody that has reminded me of my mom in her courage tackling interesting roles is julianne moore mm -hmm. i i feel like she seeks out challenging material and and that reminds me of my mom and also Laurent one of the reasons why I'm I'm kind of so excited to talk to you is because you are a cinephile you are somebody who has been steeped in this for so long and we're obviously at a very interesting point in movies right now particularly you know theatrical motion pictures um, where do you see the movies as an art form uh, kind of heading because it certainly has changed quite a bit well I mean you, you know it's a tough question because um, you know I, I grew up in in Paris which is the mecca of cinema and, and I could see any movies from uh, if I said today I want to see an Hollywood movie and this was before VHS and before uh, you know anything we have today, I I could I could go to Paris and 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 see and see her movies. Um, I I just think that in terms of of, of film history, uh, it's wonderful that now young people watching potentially our documentary will be able to go on iTunes and download all of her movies, you know, and be able to to visit with her. And, and and her films and um, and that's really exciting I, I think that there are a lot of interesting platforms for filmmakers today that that used to be the platforms that existed like when you when I was a kid you know it was like the so-called independent movies you know that were made for a shoestring budget and 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 that was a great platform for young directors you know, starting to um, to to want to make bigger movies, um, but now you can really do some interesting things for the HBOs and the Netflix and Hulu, etc. Uh, um, so that also means maybe like too much product, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's hard to to choose from, and it, it sort of mirrors a little bit, you know. Um, the lack of concentration that you get from young people, you know, where they can't focus on something for more than five minutes, you know, because there's so much more out there, you know. So it's kind of a period of transition, I think, where there's a lot of things happening and a lot of exciting stuff.
and and what's going to emerge is maybe a whole new way of 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 experiencing you know uh, this incredible art form that is um, storytelling through cinema and 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 uh, uh, whether it's narrative or documentaries. Um, so I'm kind of going in circle here. I'm sorry, but uh, um, a tough question. It's fine. Um, but it's a it's an interesting time, you know, because I. I you, you know, even I, I did this series for Netflix a few years ago, like three years ago, five came back and promoting that and now promoting this mm -hmm. is day and night. It's a completely different world. Um, it's almost like even three years ago, five came back was still very much a niche market thing. And, 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 and it just and, and this just feels like um, um, an event really uh at least that's the way i've been experiencing it and it's been it's been really kind of you know an amazing thing uh um so so it, it's you you know what used to evolve over 10 years is now evolving over three years <laughs> so you better keep up and and, and to bring us full circle with natalie wood herself is that the easiest thing in the business it's probably winning an Oscar in the face of staying relevant and having staying power in the business, you know? And um, Natalie Wood, I really think, did that. She reinvented herself. She was not afraid of reinventing herself, of taking chances with roles and directors and, and actors. And boy, did she have a good sense of who was Cheerio, to be yeah. the a uh, big star also you know um so 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 it's an interesting uh interesting time and and i think she fits right into it uh, i could literally spend the rest of the day talking hollywood and 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 natalie wood with both of you um <laughs> it's really a spectacular piece of filmmaking and and I hope people tune in on, on March on uh, May 5th on HBO to see it. Everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the Emmys, Oscars, et cetera, and stay tuned for more interviews throughout the season. Laurent, Natasha, thank you both, both very, very much. Thank you, thank so, you so much. much. We enjoyed it. Take care.